Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad, who was later given the title as Sadiq, meaning the truthful one, is the sixth Imam of the Twelve Shia Muslims. Born in the city of Medina, Imam as Sadiq lived the majority of his life in the city of his grandfather, Muhammad. During his lifetime and afterwards, Imam as Sadiq's name became synonymous with knowledge and piety. Despite the attempts to silence and harass him, Imam as Sadiq spent his entire life spreading the knowledge of Al Muhammad to students and concreting the true message of Islam in the hearts of the believers. Since the Imam lived through a time of political instability, he was able to focus his efforts on transmitting hadiths from the Holy Prophet Muhammad to students across the Muslim world. Thus, scholars have found more hadiths from Imam as Sadiq than any of the other Imams combined. It is the reason that the Twelve Shia jurisprudence is sometimes referred to as the Ja'fari school, due to the immense knowledge that we have received from Imam Ja'far bin Muhammad as Sadiq. Imam al Sadiq, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, was in a way a reincarnation of the message and teachings and traditions of the Holy Prophet of God, the Prophet Muhammad. In fact, it was the Prophet himself who prophesied and foretold the birth of Imam al-Sadiq and he was the one who gave him the title al-Sadiq meaning the truthful one because after all we know that his name the name of the sixth Imam was Ja'far the son of Muhammad but it was the Prophet who gave him the title al-Sadiq. Imam al-Sadiq was the son of Imam Muhammad al-Baqir and the grandson of Imam Ali ibn al Hussein Zain al Abidin al Sajjad, both of whom witnessed the Battle of Karbala. His proximity to these two great Imams meant that he inherited a great wealth of knowledge, discipline, and piety from his forefathers at a young age. Imam al Sadiq spent no less than 13 years with his grandfather, Imam Zain al-Abidin al-Sajjad, the son of Imam al-Hussein. And it was during those 13 years that Imam al-Sadiq learned a great deal from a sage like no other. Imam al-Sajjad, his incredible knowledge, he accompanied his father, Imam al-Baqir, for about 30, 31 years because Imam al-Sadiq became an Imam and was crowned with the title of being the vicegerent of God at the age of 31. So for the duration of those 31 years, Imam al-Sadiq was with his father. He spent a lot of time with him, learned from him. He was trained and disciplined by him. He would travel with him far and wide. Imam al Sadiq's mother, Um Farwa bint Qasim, was the daughter of Al Qasim, who was the son of Ibn Muhammad ibn Abu Bakr, the great companion of Imam Ali. Salam. During the lifetime of Imam Ali, Muhammad ibn Abu Bakr, the maternal great grandfather of Imam al Sadiq, was adopted by Imam Ali and raised in his home. Imam Ali then appointed Muhammad ibn Abu Bakr as the governor of Egypt before the latter was killed by Muawiyah. Similar to her grandfather, Muhammad, Umm Farwa bint al Qasim had a love for Imam Ali salam and his holy household and is considered as a trustworthy narrator of hadith according to Imam al Sajjad. When followers of the Sunni school try to speak of the merits of Imam al Sadiq, they attribute a quote to the Imam as saying the following, Walladani Abu Bakrin Maratain. I have been birthed by Abu Bakr not once but twice. 
And the idea here is that Imam al-Sadiq's mother was a woman, a righteous, pious, believing woman by the name of Um Farwa. Um Farwa was the daughter of Al-Qasim, who was a jurist and a learned scholar in the holy city of Medina, who was the son of Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr. Which means that Imam al-Sadiq is the great grandson of Abu Bakr through his son Muhammad and his son Qasim and his daughter Um Farwa. So the idea here is that Imam al-Sadiq is a special person because from his father's side he traces his lineage back to the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam, Amir al muminin Imam Ali and Fatima al-Zahra because his father is Muhammad ibn Ali, ibn al Hussein, ibn Ali, ibn Abi Talib. And from his mother's side, he traces his lineage back to Abu Bakr. Of course, the problem here is that being a descendant of Abu Bakr, especially in through this family tree, doesn't really mean anything. Because Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr, as we all know, was opposed to his father. Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr was the disciple of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He was one of the closest confidants and protégés and disciples of Imam Ali. He was in fact fighting alongside Ali ibn Abi Talib in the battle of the camel, where on the other side of the front, on the opposing side, you had who? You had Aisha bint Abi Bakr. So Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr was literally fighting against his own sister. And so to say that somehow there is virtue in the fact that Imam al-Sadiq was a descendant of Abu Bakr is rather disingenuous and quite frankly does not reflect reality. And so this is something that they say. We believe that even if the Imam had in fact said something like this, it is merely a reflection of his family tree. It's a statement of fact that Abu Bakr is one of my ancestors, but that really doesn't mean anything because at the end of the day, who happens to be whose father or son does not change the reality on the ground because we have prophets whose sons turned out to be impious and bad individuals like the famous case of Prophet Nuh السلام, whose son was not a good person. Following the Battle of Karbala, the Umayyad Caliph Yazid bin Muawiyah made several attempts to dissuade people from studying their faith. Many scholars during his rule were killed and imprisoned and the Ahlul Bayt was severely oppressed, harassed and sidelined from the public. Thus, the message of Islam was distorted by the scholars who were controlled and paid for by Umayyad rulers. These scholars fabricated hadiths, allowed many wrongdoings by the rulers and clothed these wrongdoings with a cloak of religiosity. As a result, the common people had no access to the knowledge of the Prophet Muhammad and the Muslim world entered into an age of jahiliya, or known as ignorance. Before the era of Imam Sadiq and Imam al-Baqir uh, people had no access to knowledge. People were left in the dark. It was a second jahiliya to the Muslims because knowledge is not something that you can, you can uh, uh, create on your own. You have to go to the, to the source. You have to be able to access the source. But because the Ahlul Bayt were sidelined, because the Ahlul Bayt were marginalized, uh, people didn't have access to knowledge. This is why in a hadith, Imam Sadiq says that before the emergence of my father, Imam al-Baqir, people didn't know what's halal and what's haram. There was only remnants of what was left from the time of the Prophet. Otherwise, the sunnah of the Prophet was destroyed. 
the sunnah of the Prophet, all the uh, hadith that were written, written down were burnt by the first caliph. This is why when Imam Sadiq came, he was able to resuscitate Islam, to revive uh, the religion of Islam. The emergence of Imam al-Baqir whose title means the one who opens knowledge, and Imam al-Sadiq, the truthful one, caused a knowledge revolution. They mentored and taught hundreds of students on all issues, whether jurisprudential, theological, medical, or even scientific. Their contributions to the faith and our worldview is immeasurable. Thus, when we want to look at our own faith today, we find that many of our own traditions are based off of narrations from Imam al-Sadiq, who established Shi'ism jurisprudential foundations as we know of them today. In terms of the contributions of Imam al-Sadiq to our worldview, to our faith tradition, to our religion, is the fact that we have something called, as part of our hadith corpus, they're called Al-Usool al arbamiah And what these are in a nutshell is these are 400 books, some of them small, others large, 400 books that have been written by companions and students of the Imams where they compiled the traditions and words and quotes of those Imams. These 400 usul or fundamentals form the bedrock of our hadith tradition today. In other words, the blessed book of Al-Kafi is based on the 400 fundamentals. Malla yahduruhu al is based on the 400 fundamentals. At-Tahdeeb is based on the 400 fundamentals. All of these great works of hadith which form the corpus of our hadith collections and therefore our jurisprudence and our theology are based on the 400 fundamentals and the vast majority of the 400 fundamentals are written by students of Imam al-Sadiq which again illustrates the pivotal central position of al-Sadiq min Ali Muhammad, the truthful Imam, the descendant of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, which in a way, and I want you to think about this long and hard, Imam al-Sadiq revived the transmission and collection and compilation of hadith, starting with the Holy Prophet, may God's peace and everlasting blessings be upon him and upon his family, all the way to his father, Imam al-Baqir. Imam al-Sadiq revived this tradition. Imam al-Sadiq gave new life to the idea that hadith is important. The thing that the Quran talks about in plain words, لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ God says that we have sent this book and we have sent you so that you would teach the people what has been revealed to them. So in order to do that, Imam al-Sadiq began to train disciples and companions and students who would carry this tradition forward and who would transmit the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt far and wide. In order to transmit these teachings, the Imam pursued a complex approach similar to those of his forefathers. While he focused on teaching some of his closest companions the secrets and knowledge of Al Muhammad, he also established and renewed the University of the Ahlul Bayt, where thousands of Muslim students were taught all kinds of sciences that they were not familiar with earlier. Researchers who study the life of Imam al Sadiq say that the Islamic civilization and the golden age of Islam owes its progress, advancement and knowledge to Imam al-Sadiq for the amount of knowledge that he passed on to his students in the various fields, many of whom became world-renowned such as Jabir ibn Hayyan, the father of chemistry. According to historians like Ibn Uqda al-Hamdani, a reliable scholar of chains of narration, Imam al-Sadiq apparently had over 4,000 students scattered across the Muslim worlds 
all of who claim to be students of Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad al-Saliq. The other example is Aban ibn Taghlib al-Kufi. Aban was such a close companion of Imam al-Sadiq and had spent so much time with him, learning from him, that when he died in the lifetime of Imam al-Sadiq, the Imam famously declared, Awja'a qalbi mawtu Aban. The death of Aban aches my heart. This man had memorized 30,000 hadiths, 30,000 quotes and narrations from his teacher Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam Now, I say this because if you have 4,000 students, one of whom is Aban ibn Taghlib, who had memorized 30,000 hadiths, imagine how much knowledge Imam al-Sadiq left. 30,000 is almost twice as many hadiths as the blessed book of Al-Kafi, which forms the bedrock of our traditions from the Prophet and his immaculate household. Another example is a man by the name of Al-Hasan ibn Ali al-Washa. Al-Hasan al-Washa was not a narrator of hadith directly from Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. Rather, he's considered among the narrators of the era of Imam al kazim and Imam al ridha alayhim as -salam. This person one day receives an individual from Bilad al ray modern day Iran. This person came to him and he said that I have been told you are famous for having heard from Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam through intermediaries. You've heard traditions of Imam al-Sadiq from some of his students. And I'd like to hear those traditions from you. So Al-Hasan Al-Washa told him, I am busy today. Why don't you come back tomorrow and we could sit and I could share what I've learned. So that man who had come from Ray, which is a fair distance to Medina, uh, or Kufa rather, where Al-Hasan Al-Washa was from, he said to him, no. I have no guarantees that I will be alive until tomorrow. So I'd like you to share with me what you have learned today. Al-Hasan al-Washa told him, had I known that there would be people like you who are so eager to learn the traditions of Ja'far ibn Muhammad and al-Sadiq, لَاسْتَكْثَرْتُ مِنْ ذَلِكْ I, will, I would have put in more effort to acquire the traditions of Imam al-Sadiq. Now that I know I have seekers like you who are so eager. And the relevant part is this. He says, because I entered the Masjid of Kufa and I saw 900 people teaching others, كُلٌّ يَقُولْ حَدَّثَنِي جَعْفَرُ بْنُ Muhammad. Now, let's try and take a few steps back here to understand exactly what's happening. Al-Hasan ibn Ali in al washa is saying that I encountered 900 individuals, each of whom was teaching their own class. They had their own students, their own circle of scholarship, and they were each quoting Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. 900 classes. What a university is this? Have you ever come across a university that has 900 classes, and that in each of those classes, the professor, the teacher, is quoting none other than Ja'far ibn Muhammad ibn al-Sadiq alayhi salam. Now, to illustrate just how amazing this really is, you need to take into account and contextualize the fact that this was in Masjid al-Kufa. Now, what does that mean? It means that had al-Hasad ibn Ali said that I saw people in the mosque of the Prophet, 900 individuals, no less, who were transmitting the hadiths of Imam al-Sadiq, that would have been strange and amazing enough. But he's saying that I have seen this in the mosque of Kufa. Now, Imam al-Sadiq did not live in Kufa. Imam al-Sadiq spent the bulk of his life in Medina. He was born in Medina and he was buried in Medina in the garden of Baqi'ah, 
What was he doing in Kufa exactly? Well, Imam al-Sadiq won the first Abbasid Caliph by the name of Abu al-Abbas al-Saffah. When he assumed power after the end of the Umayyad dynasty, he became the Khalifa, he was stationed in Kufa. He summoned Imam al-Sadiq to go to Kufa so that he could have him under his control and under his watchful eyes. Imam al-Sadiq ended up spending two years in the city of Kufa. In other words, Imam al-Sadiq only spent two years in Kufa. And yet in those two years, he trained 900 students who would then go on to teach their own classes in all fields, in all disciplines, in all different sciences. Each one saying, Haddathani Ja'far ibn Muhammad alayhi salam. The knowledge of Imam al-Sadiq was not unknown to people. Even those who had animosity towards the Imam or who disagreed with him understood his immense knowledge and contributions. Nonetheless, over the years, endless campaigns were launched against the Ahlul Bayt and their teachings. The scholars of the Shia were killed, and the books of the Shia were burned, thrown into rivers, and hadith and mainstream books were changed and even interpreted differently. As a result, there was extreme amounts of censorship against the knowledge of the Ahlul Bayt that took place by the rulers at the time and even in contemporary times. This has contributed to many people amongst the other schools of thought not knowing Imam al-Sadiq and knowing his message. It then becomes our duty to lift this veil of censorship and to reintroduce the Imam and his contributions to the public. Now, when we want to introduce Imam Sadiq to uh, people that have no familiarity with, with the Imam, what we do is we could use the words of prominent figures that they are uh, familiar with to introduce Imam Sadiq to them. Uh, we come to the likes of Malik ibn Anas. Now, Malik ibn Anas was uh, the founder of the uh, Maliki school of thought. Now, Malik ibn Anas, uh, he wasn't a follower of Imam Sadiq. If anything, he's an opponent of Imam Sadiq. He has his own uh, school of thought. And yet, when he uh, talks about Imam Sadiq because he's met with the Imam uh, uh, more than once, he says, Ma No eyes has ever seen, and no ear has ever heard, and no mind has ever comprehended or began to imagine someone greater than Imam Sadiq in three main areas. The first area in knowledge. So Malik ibn Anas here says that there is no one that comes close to Imam Sadiq when it comes to knowledge. Number two, taqwan. Again, this is a Quranic criteria. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna akramakum atqakum. The best amongst you uh, is the one that is God conscious more than the others. So Malik ibn Anas knows that Imam Sadiq was God conscious. He wasn't in pursuit of worldly desires. He could. He was capable of, of you know, pursuing all the worldly desires. He had the opportunity to satisfy all his desires, but he refused. This is why he says that uh, you can't find uh, a person that has more taqwa than uh, Imam al-Sadiq uh, Also, he says that you wouldn't find someone who worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, better than Imam al-Sadiq. And even though the Imam had many roles that he was playing, first of all, he assumed a leadership role. He had tens of thousands of followers during his time. And the Imam was a teacher. And the Imam uh, was uh, managing many, the affairs of the Muslims during his time. Uh, despite all of that, the Imam was a Abid. He worshiped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, 
like no other human being would, would worship him. Despite these words that were said by Malik ibn Anas, the founder of the Maliki school of thought, the Imam and his school of thought, the Ja'afri school, were never sanctioned by the authorities. In fact, the school was always attacked and was given the label of the Rafida or the rejectors. As a result, the four Sunni schools of thought, the Maliki, Shafi, Hanbali and Hanafi, were supported and sanctioned directly by the authorities. However, the Ja'afri school was sidelined and attacked, but ultimately independent of any outsider influence. Among the most interesting of facts, however, was that the founders of all the other schools of thought received knowledge from Imam al-Sadiq, either directly or indirectly. Thus, by looking at the Ja'afari school of thought, one can see that it is the most unique school, as it was independent and the closest one to the teachings of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. One of the most important points that we look at is what else makes it unique? If you notice the other schools of thought, they actually uh, take one school of thought over another based on the proximity to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is a very good point, the chronological proximity, which means how far away were they from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When we look at any famous people in the world and we want to write a biography about them, we look at the person who was nearest to them. So when we want to learn about Islam, this is one of the things that the Muslim scholars take into account, that what was the proximity of this person to Rasulullah from a chronological point of view. So they say, for example, Abu Hanifa was born 80 years after Hijrah and he died 150 years after Hijrah. So the proximity of Abu Hanifa is closer than any of the rest. And this is why the Hanafi school of thought is, is, is a school of thought that many of the uh, Sunnis follow. The uh, Malik bin Anas was born in 93 AH and he died in 179 AH. Uh, Ash Shafi was born in 150 after Hijrah and he died um, in 204 after Hijrah. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal was born in 164 and he died in 241. So obviously the nearest is Abu Hanifa. Now Imam al-Sadiq was also born in 80 AH, slightly before um, Abu Hanifa. However, let's just say they were born at the same time. So when you look at who is most proximal to Rasulullah, we see Imam al-Sadiq. The second thing that they look at is geographical proximity. That, for example, who was living amongst them. And the geographic proximity of uh, Malik bin Anas was the closest because Malik was somebody who lived in Medina. So we look and see that most of the North African nations, they took on the Maliki school of thought because of the fact that uh, Malik uh, bin Anas was a Madanite and because he was living in Medina and he would have lived the life of the Sahaba and he would have spoken the language of the Sahaba and therefore he would have achieved that cultural transmission of the religion, of the faith and uh, the culture. And so in North Africa they said, look, you know, we'll accept Malik uh, as uh, the, the Maliki school of thought as a main school of thought. The Hanafis, for example, because he was Iraqi, um, obviously, the people of Iraq said, you know what, Abu Hanifa is, is, is a good example that we take the Hanafi school of thought. So when we look at Imam al-Sadiq Imam al-Sadiq wins when it comes to chronological proximity. Imam al-Sadiq wins when it comes to geographical proximity is from Medina. And Imam al-Sadiq is on top when it comes to biological proximity, as we heard in the narration earlier with Abu Hanifa. This is the fourth and final major point where we look at and say that Imam al-Sadiq school of thought is the most unique, the fact that it was a school of thought based on revelation. That Imam al-Sadiq would say hadithi, hadith abi wa hadith abi, hadith jaddi, that my tradition is the tradition of my father and the tradition of my father is the tradition of his father, my grandfather, and the tradition of my grandfather is the tradition of Ali ibn Abi Talib, and the tradition of Ali ibn Abi Talib, that's it, what more do you want? It's the tradition of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Even Imam al-Sadiq, he says, that our revelation comes to us elder upon elder, sends down that revelation. So here we have that not only, again, we're talking about the proximal, geographical, chronological, uh, biological transmission of the fiqh, of the jurisprudence, of the culture, comes into Imam al-Sadiq is revealed into Imam al-Sadiq and he says, we take it, he says, and we cover it. We protect it like people protect their gold and silver. This is the knowledge that we bring. During the tenure as an Imam, the Imam would try to correct incorrect and contradicting beliefs. Amongst these beliefs was Qiyas, which is known as injunction or analogy. Analogy involves an earlier decision being followed in a later case 
because the later case is similar to the earlier one. The Imam was extremely opposed to this belief. The reason behind this was that the use of Qiyas can result in many incorrect jurisprudential laws being deduced, because no one solution can apply to different cases. Furthermore, when using Qiyas, one will likely ignore the context of the ruling, which will again result in incorrect deduction. Being the founder of the Hanafi school of thought, Abu Hanifa used comparison as a source of legislation and jurisprudence. He used the method of deduction and applied it to Islamic jurisprudence, despite the multiple contradictions that this method usually results in. In a famous quote, Imam al-Sadiq is mentioned to have said, My father narrated from my great-great-great-great-grandfather, the Holy Prophet, who said, Those who act on the basis of analogy will face their destruction and lead others to their destruction. Those who give fatwas without the knowledge of the abrogating and the abrogated the clear text and that which requires interpretation, they will face destruction and lead others to their destruction. As a result, the Imam had a well-known debate with Abu Hanifa on this issue, as he considered it to be one of the most dangerous ways of extracting legislation. So one day, Abu Hanifa hears that Imam al-Sadiq had arrived. So he went to see the Imam. Now remember that Abu Hanifa at this point was a little established. He had his own school, his own students. So he went to see the Imam at his residence. When he went, he asked for permission to enter the house and address the Imam. The Imam refused to give him permission. Now this is important because you have people out there who say that there was nothing but harmony between Imam al-Sadiq and his quote-unquote student Abu Hanifa but that could not be farther from the truth. Abu Hanifa asked for permission, the Imam refused to give him permission. So he stood outside for a while. Eventually there was a group of people who came, they asked for permission, they were granted permission, Abu Hanifa simply slipped and he slipped himself into that group and he went inside the house of Imam Sadiq When they sat down, Abu Hanifa said, I have a question. The Imam said, what's your question? He said, why is it that your followers in Kufa curse the Khulafa? You have followers who profess a relationship with you and claim to be obedient to you and they curse the Khulafa. Why don't you stop them? Maybe, maybe one of the reasons that the Imam refused to give him permission because he knew that he would do things like that. He would try and stir trouble. He would try and cause a controversy. As we've seen world over, individuals who aren't asking to learn, they ask questions just to cause a controversy, just to cause a stir and just to stand out. So when he asked this question, the Imam said to him that I have ordered them, but they refuse to listen. So the Imam told him that I have told my followers, but they refuse to listen. So then he insisted, Abu Hanifa insisted that if they are truly your followers, then you're responsible for their actions. So listen to what the Imam told him. The Imam said to him, first of all, I commanded you to stay outside and yet you disobeyed me and came inside along with this group. You disobeyed me right here and you expect my followers to listen to what I have to say? If you have refused to accept and obey my simple instructions to stay outside, what else do you expect from people who live across the world or in a different country or a different city? That's one point. The second point is, don't you believe in analogy? He said, yes, I do. The Imam told him, how could you believe in analogy, in Qiyas, when analogy goes against the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He said, how so? The Imam told him, let me ask you some questions. Which is greater, meaning a greater crime? Killing someone, murder? 
or adultery. Abu Hanifa said, obviously, again, this is if you go with your own uh, deductive analogy, if with your own mind, if you try to draw conclusions, you might say, well, it's obvious. Murder is worse than adultery. The Imam told him if that is the case, why is it that to convict someone of murder, you need two witnesses, but to convict someone of adultery, you need four witnesses. To kill someone, like you've killed everyone, and yet all you need to convict a murderer is two eyewitnesses. But for adultery, you need four of them to come and give testimony that they saw the act happening with their own eyes. Abu Hanifa was flabbergasted. He was dumbfounded. He had no answer. Despite the discussions they had, Abu Hanifa continued to study under Imam al-Sadiq for at least two years. Abu Hanifa went on to establish the Hanafi school of thought, which adheres in many things that Imam al-Sadiq was against. Nonetheless, according to several narrations and records, Abu Hanifa used to say, without the two years Al-Numan would have perished. Apart from his debates with Abu Hanifa and the likes, the Imam was also debating many atheists and agnostics who tried to dissuade people from Islam and religion. During the time of Imam al-Sadiq, the atheist and agnostic movement were growing rapidly due to the disenfranchisement and oppression that the people faced from the Caliphate, which was ruling the Muslim Empire. When the people looked at the so-called Islamic Caliphate under the Umayyads and the Abbasids, they saw corruption, injustice, oppression and inequality. While all of this was happening, the Caliphs lived lavish lives and equity was distributed amongst their families while others remained poor and neglected. All this could potentially lead to was a society which questioned the very notion of Islam when such oppression is widespread. It was due to this that the Imam dedicated a lot of his time and power to enter dialogue with these individuals who were calling for atheism and agnosticism. The arguments used by both parties remain relevant today and are at all times still very much used. And so at that time there was this movement where, hold on a minute, what if the case is that um, based on this, if this is what God is, then no, I, this is something I reject and so they began to argue to try and destroy it and obviously when they argued with many of the other uh, scholars or the scholarly class um, with some of these arguments they could easily destroy some of the other scholarly class but when they would come and, and say all right there's this if you really have a strong argument come and argue with Imam Sadiq or the students of Imam Sadiq when we look at Imam Sadiq and some of the things the Imam says and many of them are taken by contemporary scholars, but they don't write back and say, oh, or, or write that this is where I sourced it or this is where I got it from. And what I'm referring to particularly is Pascal's Wager, what they call Pascal's Wager. And uh, it's known commonly as Pascal's Wager, whereas Imam Sadiq has said it far before this, long before this. And Imam Sadiq obviously the Imams were very clear with their sources when they would say, Qala Abi An Jaddi, my father, my grandfather, An Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And so when Imam Sadiq talks about um, this particular one which is commonly known as Pascal's Wager, it's Ibn Abi Al-Awja, is looking at the Muslims doing tawaf. And him and his atheist buddies are having a bit of a discussion, look at these people doing tawaf, do they not look like animals that are just walking around, like a herd of sheep? So they're mocking the Muslims. And then Ibn Abi Al-Awja says, but it is as if that one that is in the middle of them, he's different, he's almost angelic. And he points towards Imam Sadiq salam When they come back out, Imam al-Sadiq doesn't even wait for him to talk. Imam al-Sadiq speaks immediately and says, if it is what you say, and what Ibn Abi al-Awja was saying basically is, we live and we die and there's nothing after this. That they say that the only thing that kills us is time. But Allah says, but you have no knowledge that it is just time. Just time is relative. So people think that it's just time. We're just born into this world, we leave this world and there's nothing after this world. So this is what Ibn Abi al-Awja was saying to his atheist buddies. And when Imam al-Sadiq came up, he says to him, Oh, Ibn Abi al-Awja, if it is what you say, it is, and it is not. This means that both of us have lived 
both of us eat, both of us drink, both of us uh, procreate. And we both lose nothing. But if it is, as you say, not, meaning there is a day of judgment, and there is a day of judgment, then although we have both done everything the same, when I die it will be eternal bliss, and when you die it will be eternal punishment. Because the Imam was in such a critical point of history, which was during the collapse of the Umayyad Empire, and the rise of the Abbasid Empire, he had many opportunities to get involved in power and become amongst the ruling elite. However, the pleasures of this world did not entice or tempt the Imam, as the Imam had higher and a more noble motive, bringing people closer to Allah. Abu Muslim al-Khurasani, who was one of the main players that played a pivotal role in solidifying the uh, Abbasid's grip on power. He was able to oust the Umayyads in Khurasan and after doing so, knowing that he can impose himself on the Muslims, on the Muslim nation, what he did, he sought the help of Imam Sadiq because he knew that the Ahlul Bayt have a clean reputation. Everyone would embrace the Ahlul Bayt So what he did, he sent a delegation to Imam Sadiq who was in the holy city of Medina. His messenger was carrying a special message, a special uh, letter to the Imam. He went and he met with the Imam and he gave the Imam the letter of Abu Muslim al-Khurasani. Abu Muslim had just assumed the role of leadership in the uh, Muslim empire. He is sending a message to Imam Sadiq. The Imam receives the letter. He opens the letter and he finds that Abu Muslim al-Khurasani is saying that I want you to join me so that you can become the emperor. You can become the king of the Muslim nation. The Imam read the letter and he didn't hesitate. He didn't need time to think about the proposal, the lucrative offer that the, the new king is, is making to the Imam. The Imam took the letter and he quickly placed it inside the lantern, burning it into, reducing it into, into ash. So the messenger was waiting for, for the Imam to give him a verbal uh, answer, to respond to the letter, or at least to write something in response to Abu Muslim al Khurasani. But the Imam didn't say anything. So the Messenger said, Ya ibn Rasulullah, I am waiting for an answer. I have to give uh, your response to Abu Muslim al Khurasani straight away. I'm going back to Khurasan today. The Imam said, Just tell him what you saw, that I burnt his letter. I'm not interested in this offer. When the messenger left, the people who were around the Imam were mesmerized. They said, Ya ibn Rasulullah, the Umayyads ruled for so many years and they did what they did and you were oppressed. Now you have this golden opportunity to reclaim your right. The Imam said, zaman zamani rajali. This is not my time. And these men, Abu Muslim al-Khurasani and his soldiers and his people and his advisors and the Abbasids, they are not my men. These people are in pursuit of worldly pleasures. These are not my men. I have a different agenda. My agenda is to turn people into God-fearing people, to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These people want to rule. And they wanted the Imam to come to join them, to use the Imam as a tool and the Imam refused to give them that. Now in another incident, Mansur al-Dawaniqi, years later, Mansur al-Dawaniqi eventually killed Abu Muslim al-Khurasani. Even though it was Abu Muslim al-Khurasani that helped Mansur al-Dawaniqi become the ruler, he is not happy with the Imam. Why isn't he happy with, isn't, isn't he happy with the Imam? Because when he comes to Medina, Everyone rushes to visit the Khalifa. Everyone compete over who would go in and see him first. But the Imam wouldn't go. 
the Imam wouldn't visit him. So Abu Muslim al so Al-Mansur al-Dawaniqi, the Caliph of the time, and the father of Harun al-Abbasi, he sends a letter to Imam al-Sadiq saying, لِمَ لَا تَغْشَانَا كَمَا يَغْشَانَ النَّاسِ Everyone is visiting us. Why don't you visit us? The Imam said to him that we don't have interests, that we fear that you might uh, be, you know, taking them away from us. We have nothing that we fear you for, nothing worldly that is of concern to us. And there is nothing that you have that we desire, that we want. Yes, you are in charge of, of this world. You are controlling the, uh, the affairs of, of the Muslims, but we're not interested in the things that you have, in the dunya that you are controlling. We're not interested at all. This is not what we're looking for. So the man, the Caliph said to him that, why don't you visit us? to advise us, to offer us a word of advice. The Imam said, من أراد الدنيا لا ينصحك. If I am in pursuit of worldly desires, I wouldn't be sincere in my advice to you. I would say, I would nod to everything that you say. I would agree to everything that you say because I want your satisfaction. I wouldn't disagree with you. وَمَنْ أَرَادَ الْآخِرَةَ لَا يَصْحَبُكِ And if, if there is someone who is in pursuit of the afterlife, then such a person wouldn't give you company, wouldn't be with you, because being with you would, uh, would be at the, at the cost of the, of the afterlife. So Mansur al-Dawaniqi, these words should have infuriated him, should have enraged him. The Imam saying that I'm not interested in you. Mansur al-Dawaniqi said that his words gave me the gauge through which I can judge the people. Anyone who comes chasing after me, I know that he is in pursuit of worldly affairs. Anyone who is not showing interest in me is someone who is in pursuit of the Akhirah. So this is something that I can use to judge Seeing the respect and authority that Imam al-Sadiq had over the people, all of the ruling class and the elites were afraid of the Imam's position and authority. They oppressed the Imam, arrested him several times and moved him from city to city. Despite this, they failed to silence him. Following the rise and the firm establishment of the Abbasid Empire, the Abbasid Caliphs were extremely afraid of the authority that the Imam had over his followers as they knew he had a stronger claim to the Caliphate of the Muslim Ummah over them. As a result, Al-Mansur al-Dawaniqi, the second Abbasid Caliph, poisoned the Imam on the 25th of Shawwal in the year 148 after Hijra, and the Imam was subsequently buried in Jannat al-Baqi, near his father Imam al-Baqir, and his grandfathers Imam al-Sajjad, Imam al-Hasan, and the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa In 1926, the tombs of Imam al-Sadiq and his holy forefathers were raised to the ground by the Saudi ruling family, who considered the shrines idolatrous, even though previous Sunni scholars did not consider them to be so. Despite multiple attempts to rebuild the shrines, all attempts have failed, and visitors are still unable to go to his grave.